When the Federation first caught wind of Zeon's mobile suits, they were unimpressed and disinterested. The main feeling amongst the top brass was that these new toy robots would prove insignificant on the battlefield, choosing instead to rely on their brand new fleet. But this feeling would begin to change after Zeon's new toys managed to deal an almost decisive blow against the Federation's supposedly invincible fleet. But despite this, it still took someone like General Revel to finally get the ball rolling on the Federation's mobile suit development plans. This plan received the codename Operation V, short for Operation Victory, and it had the daunting task of accomplishing in a few months what had taken Xeon five years to perfect. This would then result in the RX-75 gun tank, the Federation's first operational mobile suit, although it could hardly be classified as a true mobile suit. If only they'd had access to an online learning community filled with millions of creative people and thousands of classes on a variety of topics. Just like today's sponsor, Skillshare. Whether you're trying to enhance your skills, explore new hobbies, or you're just trying to fight off lockdown boredom, Skillshare has your back. And the first 1,000 people to use my link down below in the description or the pinned comment will get a free two-month access to all of that content. Personally, I found some really cool looking guides on how to film on a budget by Christopher Rhodes and another one on how to make merch by Aaron Draplin, which I will definitely check out later on today or tomorrow or the day after that. Productivity was definitely something on the Federation's mind when creating the gun tank. In order to save as much time as possible, other companies and projects were also incorporated into its development. And a few defected Xeon mobile suit engineers and scientists also lent a helping hand. The mobile suit itself was based on the experimental RTX-44 main battle tank. Initially, this machine was developed as the replacement of the Federation's aging Type 61 main battle tank, but during its development it was redesigned as an anti-mobile suit fighting vehicle. As a result, it had significantly higher firepower than the Type 61, with two massive 240mm cannons and four anti-air rocket launchers. This also meant that it weighed 97 tons and had an unacceptable loss of mobility. Even though by March 20th, Universal Century 0079, four prototypes had been completed, they were considered unfit for combat. The RX-75 then inherited the RTX-44's general shape and ideas, but had several improvements that did make it a more suitable combat machine. Its main engine now became the Takim NC-4, a hybrid engine that combined a nuclear fusion reactor and a gas turbine. While this was a powerful combination that had enough juice to propel the gun tank, it was insufficient for energy weapons. As a result, it retained the RTX 44's physical weapons, although downscaled and lighter. The main armaments were now two 120mm cannons on the shoulders that had enough firepower to destroy a mobile suit in one shot and had a firing range of 260 kilometers. The secondary weapons were the four tube 40mm Bob missile launchers that the gun tank had instead of traditional hands. While these fast firing missiles did little damage against mobile suits, they were very useful against lightly armored vehicles and aircraft or they could also serve as a last-ditch defensive weapon. Their range was around 20 kilometers. Initially, plans were also made for various missile launchers that could replace the Bob missile launchers, but these never left the developmental stage. Originally, four prototypes were produced, but it would only be from the second prototype on that the gun tank would be classified as a true mobile suit as opposed to a tank. This was thanks to the introduction of the Hervik Company's core block system and the core fighter that would go inside of it. The idea here was that, to make sure that the valuable test data had a higher chance of survival, the cockpit would also double as an escape craft that even had limited offensive capabilities. The four gun tanks then underwent two more overhauls, resulting in the final version, the RX-75-4. However, the inclusion of the core block system had one big disadvantage. It made it so that the body couldn't move, 
and in order to adjust the aim of the main cannons, the gun tank therefore had to move itself on its treads. Because of this and its lack of mobility, only 8 units were produced before production shifted to other units. In addition to the abdominal cockpit, the gun tank also featured a second cockpit in the head for a dedicated gunner. This has led to some confusion on whether or not the gun tank was pilotable with just one pilot, or if two were still required until a certain modification was made. It seems that this confusion stems from the first prototype that didn't have the core block system and thus required two pilots versus the later prototypes with a core block system that allowed a single pilot to control the gun tank. The reason then that it was still sometimes seen with two pilots instead of just one in the core block system is possibly due to the fact that it was simply more of a tank than a mobile suit and that the traditional job division seen in tanks was simply the most effective. Whether or not the later variants of the gun tank that excluded the core block system could also be piloted with a single pilot is not known at the moment. Another fun fact is that despite being mostly designed as a ground unit, it did come complete with thrusters, so it was technically usable in space. Unsurprisingly though, it was even more cumbersome in space and the gun tank and its descendants would be used almost exclusively on Earth as a result. Even though the gun tank has sometimes been referred to as a failed mobile suit, it was nonetheless an important step in the Federation's mobile suit development and even resulted in its own lineage. The first variant was the RX-75 gun tank mass production type and as its name indicated, it was an attempt to mass produce the gun tank. The biggest change other than its overhauled aesthetic was that it no longer used the core block system. While this meant that it no longer had the core fighter as an escape craft, it also meant that the gun tank mass production type had a movable waist, which then made it much easier to target things. Another change was that its backpack could now be lowered to act as a counterweight for increased stability during firing. Despite performing very well in its intended tasks of artillery support and bombardments, the gun tank mass production type would only see limited production and would be mostly relegated to base defense after the war ended. Still, one variant of the mass production type is known to have existed. This machine was known as the Berga gun tank and had its cannons replaced with cranes and also had a dozer blade attached to its front, in addition to other makeshift customizations. Given the fact that these units shared their model numbers with the actual gun tank mass production types, it is highly likely that these units were all battlefield improvisations and all had their own unique features to them. The gun tank mass production types were then followed up and replaced by the RMV-1 gun tank 2. It took some of the changes of the mass production type, such as removal of the core block system for better rotation, and also had various other changes to turn it into more of a mobile vehicle as opposed to a mobile suit. Other than just feeling more like a tank, its firepower was upgraded to turn it into an even better fire support unit. Rather than the wimpy 40mm Bob missile launchers, it now had one 4-tube 180mm rocket launcher and a large 3-tube missile launcher of similar caliber. For anti-infantry, it featured a 60mm machine cannon on its chassis, and as its main weapons, it of course retained the two 120mm cannons. But even though development progressed smoothly thanks to the Federation's experience with fighting vehicles, the gun tank wasn't ready until the very end of the One Year War and would only be used in combat afterwards. Although some sources claim that it did see some action. A desert version known as the RMV-1E Gun Tank 2 Kai was also produced, but other than its color scheme and a few desert-oriented modifications, it was essentially the same unit. How the Gun Tank 2 performed though is up for debate. Most available footage of the Gun Tank 2 can be considered as less than flattering and presents them as less of a mobile vehicle and more of a mobile target. The Gun Tank 2 Kai, on the other hand, was said to have developed a reputation for having high firepower and was therefore considered as an excellent fire support unit that was a true asset to your team. 
This last interpretation seems to be confirmed by another gun tank variant, the RMV-3M, the local control type gun tank. This machine took the idea of the Gun Tank 2 even further. Again, it was armed with 120mm cannons as its main armament, and its silhouette was even more that of a fighting vehicle. In place of its arms, a local control type was equipped with three tube missile launchers of unknown caliber, and these units were mainly used for mopping up operations in Africa, where they performed very well. So it would seem that, unlike their popular depiction as just target practice for whatever Xeon they encountered, these units were not to be underestimated. One interesting thing about the local control type then, is that it used the same chassis as the original RX-75, but it was turned around and now also had a dozer blade for clearing obstacles. The final unit then that we have to cover isn't really a variant of the gun tank, but more like a sister unit because it was developed from the same machine, the RTX-44. Not wanting the four already produced prototypes to go to waste, the Federation upgraded these units into the RTX-440 ground assault type gun tank. And these units were perhaps some of the strongest gun tanks to ever see combat. They came standard with a 220mm main cannon, 30mm bot machine guns on the arms, and a flamethrower on the left arm. Optional weapons then included 56 tube missile launchers, the multi-launch rocket system, and heavy mines. And even with all of this stuff attached to it, the gun tank still had a surprising top speed and enough agility to pose a serious threat to even the latest Xeon machines such as the Goof or the Dom. Sadly enough, no more of these amazing units were produced due to them being used in a Federation intelligence ploy that involved all of their data being leaked to Xeon. This then resulted in three of the four assault types being used in a penal battalion during the first wave of Operation Odessa, and none of them would see the end of it. One final thing to mention about the gun tank then is that it wasn't directly developed into the gun cannon and later the Gundam but rather they were developed alongside each other. Unlike Xeon, who initially only focused on bipedal units, the Federation went with two design routes. The bipedal units that would then result in the gun cannon and the Gundam, and units with caterpillar treads and thrusters that would result in the gun tank and ball units respectively. And despite bipedal units becoming the norm, the gun tank's influence could still be felt in some future designs such as the D-50C Loto, a miniaturized mobile suit with a lot of utility. Not only did it still pack a surprising punch for such a small machine, but it could also serve as a battlefield command center and as a troop carrier for up to 8 soldiers. This very successful design then resulted in the F-50D gun tank a failed unit that never made it past the prototype stage. This unit is sometimes also seen with the model number R44, but this designation was given to one particular unit belonging to a private museum. The owner of this museum was called Roy, and he was 44 years old when he got the gun tank in his possession. Hence the origin of this model number. Despite the eventual failure of the F-50D, Anaheim Electronics had full faith in this unit during development and had already begun designing an up-armed version known as the Powered Weapons Type. This was basically the same unit but with different weapons such as a Mega Machine Cannon and a Twin Beam Cannon. Compared to the conventional weaponry of the normal F-50D, the Powered Weapon Type could have been a much more successful unit, although it is unlikely that it was ever made due to the failure of the former. But that is all for this video of development history. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more similar content in the future. Then all that's left for me to do now is to give a big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Again, links down below. And of course, another big thank you to the Patreon supporters. I hope all of you watching have a great day and I'll see you all next time.